Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship. Glad you're here this morning. Uh, Glad I'm here this morning. Uh, Paul Eilenfeldt is my name, and I'm uh, one of the fillers in for you uh, as you go through this time between your regular pastor. Uh, Is this announcement time? I don't think it is. We have announcements later. All right, then we open with song. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. We pray together the prayer of the day. Holy God, our strength and our redeemer, by your spirit hold us forever, that through your grace we may worship you and faithfully serve you, follow you, and joyfully find you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The lesson is from Psalm 40. I waited patiently for the Lord He inclined to me and heard me cry. He drew me up from the deep, from the desolate pit, out of the miry bog, and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. 
He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Happy are those who make the Lord their trust, who do not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after false gods. You have multiplied, O Lord of God. Your wonderful deeds and your thoughts towards us, none can compare with you. Were I to proclaim and tell of them, they would be more than can be counted. Sacrifice and offering me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, here I am. In the scroll of the book, it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O oh my God. Your law is within my heart. I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. See, I have not restrained my lips. As you know, O oh Lord, I have not hidden your saving help within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. Do not, O oh Lord, withhold your mercy from me. Let not your love and your faithfulness keep me safe forever. The word of God. Please rise as you're able for the Holy Gospel. The Gospel of John, the first chapter, beginning with the 29th verse. The next day, he, uh, this is uh, John the Baptist is talking about. The next day, he, John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming towards him and declared, Here, is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from the heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water, he said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples, and as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw these two disciples of John following him, he said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, why are you, where are you staying? He said to them, come and see. They came and they saw where he was staying and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon when one of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, he first found his brother Simon, and he said to him, We have found the Messiah. He brought Simon, and he brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at Peter and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. 
the rock. The word of God. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Imagine it was you as one of those disciples uh, with John the Baptist who pointed to Jesus and said, that's him. That, that is the promised one. He is here and he is in the flesh right here. That's the Savior of the world. The, uh, what did he call it? The, the one to be sacrificed. Um, at first they just followed Jesus. And then Jesus turned around and he says to him, to, says to these, these two fellows following him, he says, uh, what is it you're looking for? Now, if, if you're among those, if you're with those, those two disciples and that it happened to you now, Jesus comes and says, oh, you're, you're my followers. You've been following me. What are you looking for? What's your answer? What is it that you come here this morning looking for, hoping to get from Jesus? The disciples, it appears, were kind of befuddled. <laughs> I'm not sure what to answer, <laughs> as you might be right now. But uh, um, th what they came up with was, uh, wh wh where are you staying? <laughs> I don't think that was at the top of their minds or what it was that actually drew them to be following Jesus, right? <laughs> but that's what came out. Where, where are you staying? And what did Jesus say? What he says to us, come and see for yourselves. Come and see. And the story goes on that they came with Jesus and they saw where he lived and they stayed with him the whole day, which I'm sure Jesus was quite pleased with. And I'm wondering how that's been for you this past week in your spending time all day with Jesus as his being a conscious part of your everyday life. I've been here a couple times Sundays now with you, and I've kind of been laying the groundwork for that kind of daily awareness to maybe come to your mind a bit more often and more easily. And I hope that's been happening for you. But I know for me, even though I, I preach and teach about how to follow Jesus more closely, I still struggle every day and every week with the challenge of keeping my mind and my heart always open to process everything that's going on in my life with him as his partner. Because that's what Jesus wants with us, is to become a partner, a, a, a co-liver of your life. Not that he takes over and runs it all, he wants you to be you because you are different from you and you are different from all of them. You all are unique, different people through whom God wants love to come into the world because it's shaped differently as it comes out of each of us, right? Think of the people you chose to marry and how much you find out about how different they are once you start living with them for a while or once you start trying to parent your children and need to make decisions about how to do it in the best way. And you find you've got different points of view. We're all different by God's design. But we need him to help us not take our perspectives and make them the center of life. And look at everybody who's different from us through our noses. As if, what's the matter with you, stupid? That's not how you raise a kid to be at his best or her best. The challenges of making two into one, where one doesn't take over the other. One doesn't rule from on top autonomously. That's what Jesus came into the world. That's why God came into the world embodied as one of us in order to teach us and show us this way to live life in harmony, in harmonious oneness 
with people who in ways sound crazy to us when they suggest that we might do it a little bit more their way than your way or preference. How do you make friends out of people who feel like enemies? Well, what I'm gradually learning is that my perception of who's my enemy is often inaccurate and destructive to the reign of God's love in my life. As there's almost a, an immediate reaction if somebody challenges how I want to do something, especially if it's my wife, that <laughs> there's going to be a wall goes up and it's like, oh, an opposition to what I want. That's life when we're in charge and Jesus isn't. Jesus doesn't want us to give in to what other people are thinking we should be doing at all. He wants us to be able to contribute our perspective into the mix, but not to run the show. And he doesn't come to run our show. He comes to be our partner in bringing the fullness of life, more to life, in us and then through us as we live as better friends with one another, not servants, that, 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 that you're, you're married in order to be enslaved to your wife or to your husband. God's call is not to slavery, but to freedom that is shaped and empowered and limited and blessed and enriched by love that is God. God is love, this great mystery. How do we grasp that with our heads? We can't, except partially with our heads. We come to know it with our hearts. Do you know what the scientists have just discovered recently about our hearts? They have neuron cells in, in it. It has neuron cells in it, your heart does. Neuron cells are only found in our brain up to this point. And now the scientists have discovered that there's, there's a weird, it's a different type, but it's a neuron. It's a brain cell in your heart. You got about 40,000 of them. There. They've counted them already. <laughs> but they've, uh, it blew my mind that they identified brain cells in our heart, which, which makes sense to what the scriptures and what Jesus has been teaching us for years that we have to know something in our heart. How can we know something with our heart? Our heart is a pump. It's all muscle. They've discovered it's not all muscle pumping blood. There are neurons of a different type, like the brain. There is a knowing that can happen in our hearts that I think is exactly what the scriptures talk about, when God's spirit is talking to our spirit and our spirit comes to know God and know love in our hearts in a way that our brains can't grasp because our brains are an either-or mechanical computer. It is either good or it is bad, which means unless we're perfect, we're bad. And we haven't arrived at where God wants us to be or where we want to be. And so we get in, drawn into this attempt to try to be perfect, which means we got to eliminate all opposition. And all of that is what builds what? Chaos and hostility and fights in marriages and families, in neighborhoods and in the world. God invites us to something better. He invites humanity to something better, and he does it through Jesus being an embodied human being with perfect love on display. And he displays it by not doing what everybody else wants him to be doing, but by doing what love does and doing it better than we can and calling us to what? Follow him. Now, what? as I came to that point of kind of introduction to this story, which intrigued me that the disciples give this lame answer of, of oh, what we want is to know where you live. <laughs> uh, and that all of us struggle, and yet all of us are committed. That's why you're here this morning. 
because we have tasted the goodness of love in Jesus. And it feeds the depths of our soul, and it is the means through which we can build, at least to some degree, harmony between us and our God, a harmonious intermingling. And if we experience, and as we experience that, then we are more able to bring it to our families, our spouses, and our friends and our view of other people in the world that we never get to meet, but we react to them when we're watching TV and hear about what they're doing, that we will find love intermingled more fully when we relate to everyone and everything, including ourselves. And it will be when we come to know love at its deepest and its best in Jesus. And when we think about where, well, where, 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 where do you generally locate Jesus being? When you think, oh, where is Jesus? Is that why you come to church? It's because this, this is the, the building where the presence of God is at its pinnacle, at its peak, the best place to come? How, how many find church being the best place to come to, to feel God's presence? I, I, I don't want to raise hands and have you all identify. <laughs> I just want to suggest and urge you <coughs> to not forget what's on your bulletin insert. So, that's why I wrote it down in a new bullet insert. Get out your bullet insert. It's got some things for you to look at, read, take home, and read again. And turn to the page where it says harmony on the top, harmony in the scriptures, where you find the first passage saying what? Let's read it together. The great mystery, the good news is this. Christ is in you which means that you share in the glory of God. That, I've come to conclude more and more in my old age, is the essence of it all, and that's why it's called the essence of the good news, which we Lutherans say is prominent in the center of who we are and what we do, but not so often. Because the good news is not, God is not in his holy temple a building. He is in his holy temple you. And his holy temple me. And his holy temple, all of the people in your family. And his holy temples of all of the people on the earth. Christ is in you. Love is in you. But the question is, are you enjoying it? I think it was last week I talked about the kingdom of God is the party. And those crazy two passages, that, that Old Testament passages, the law of the tithe, that when I preach about it and teach about it, I find hardly anybody knows about it. They're just amazed. It says we're supposed to have a party with the whole tithe two years out of three? That's what the Bible says, and it's a law. It is the law of the tithe. And if you violate the law of the tithe, the Old Testament says, you are to be killed just like killing someone, the punishment is death. Violating the law of the tithe can also be punished by death. Why would God say such a, you have a, such an extreme punishment for this? I've come to conclude it's because it is so critically, critically at the core of you and I deepening our faith if we do not come to an experience of wonder and awe of our glory and our beauty and our value in God's sight, our faith will be very superficial and very focused on the wrong things. They will be missing this core reality of who I am embodies the glory of God bears the being of God. Where does Christ live? Where is Jesus living today? In you is the first and primary place God wants you to see his presence and to see the glory and beauty and goodness of it and enjoy it. That's what faith is. It takes faith because you ain't perfect. <laughs> and I ain't perfect. None of us reach perfection here on earth which is why the forgiveness of sins is so critically important. It's what keeps 
God's love for us alive. So he, in order to do that, he just dismisses all that's messed up in our coming from our fears and our insecurities that make, make mutual, mutual oneness and harmony difficult to come by. He keeps seeing there's something more than that and better than that and bigger than that in my view as, Jesus, as God looks at us. That's what love does. And think of how you relate to your kids when they haven't learned how to walk yet. Do you punish them for not being able to walk better? No. I think you, you, you realize that a loving parent is going to be very understanding of all of their tumbling and falling, not punishing it. You want to encourage them to be able to do it. And what do you keep doing? Saying, oh, you can do it, but try again. It often takes a lot of tries. And yeah, I've, I've had, and then you tell them about your, your falls and the way you, you uh, have to try again and again when you learn new things, right? That's what we do when, we're, when love is alive in our parenting. My question for you is, how alive is love in your parenting yourself or in your nurturing your own growth into a fuller and deeper union with God? There's where you need the same, bring the same love. And that's why Jesus invented and suggested and urged us to have a Holy Communion Supper regularly to remind ourselves what? That Christ is in us and we share in the glory of God. So here's some wine, here's some bread. Take it, chew it, and swallow it. That's that reminder of this holy presence that is love embodied. Coming in to be a part of you so that you can find what you need to see the beauty and goodness and glory of you. And then see it more fully in the people sitting across the kitchen table from you. And then to see it in the lives of even those people who are at their worst extremes and possessed by darkness and are having rampages of killing or hurting, raping, ruining the fullness of life in so many people, that we can bring love there as well. So on this sheet, you've got some passages. Oops, now we just got just a little bit of time. Uh, that's why I wrote it down. I figured we wouldn't get through this, but you can take it home and read each of these. Each of these passages is one that talks about this mystery of God generating friendship between enemies and a mutual, harmonized togetherness that he creates in, in friendships and in families and in the world between neighbors and world neighbors to the degree that they are living in this flow of God's love and presence, the great mystery. What did he say? First, it's Jesus' prayer. That's that first passage. The prayer that Jesus prayed right before he went to the cross. So we know that this, this one focuses on the core and the essence of his whole life and ministry. And he's praying to God. He's talking with God about it. He says, I pray that they may all be one, Father. May they be, what? In us. Just as you are in me and I am in you. I gave them the same glory that you gave me. Here it is again. I gave them the same glory you gave me so that they may be one. The purpose of your glory, of your being, having the beauty and the goodness that you carry in your own being in a way different from other people, but nonetheless beautiful and good. I gave them the glory so they may be one, just as you and I are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be one. Harmonized togetherness. That they may be one, in order that the world, that those in the world may know that you love them as you love me until the world sees in the church, until the world sees in your family life and the way you react to the people around you in the world who ain't perfect, 
none of whom are perfect, until the world sees love, deep love, the world's not going to be coming to church or inclined to come in our direction. Passage 2. In union with Christ, you are being built together with all others into a place where God lives through his spirit. Where are you living, Jesus? What's the answer? It ought to be at the top of your head instantly. In me and in all of us. And here it is so plain. In union with Christ, you are being built together with all others into a place where God lives through his spirit. But notice it's a process description. It's saying you are being built. It is a process of building this kingdom of God, the reign of love in the world. But that's our purpose. What's your purpose for being here? For living? To help God to extend the glory and the goodness of his being by making we humans the top grade being. <laughs> he also made the squirrel beings and the chicken beings and the bird beings and the, all the other beings, all the other creatures, but we were at the top because we are not controlled by instinct, although we have instincts, but we have his own spirit that can relate and intermingle with our spirit. We can know in our hearts what love is and what forgiveness is and the freedom in loving friendship and how that feels and what it does for us. And all of those good feelings need to be enjoyed by you and me which is to be experienced and absorbed so that who we are becomes more a united thing, a partnership with our creator, with love. And we become more and more fully able to be more and more united in love and harmony with one another and build the harmony rather than the chaos. One more. God is light. Here's another, another image, another picture God uses to, to, to describe this mystery. God is light and there is no darkness at all in him. If we live in the light, then we have fellowship with one another. There it is again. This word about a harmonized togetherness of friends. Fellowship, that's what's all in that word. But it's, it's when we live in the light, which is a way of describing light, the light of love, the light that comes from love, the light that is love, the lightness that comes in the forgiveness of sins from one another and that we can give and need to give to ourselves. There is a light, there is a brightness, there is a glow rather than a darkness. There is light that is another word used to describe who and what God is. God is love. God is light. And when the light comes, the darkness dissipates and disappears. So, bottom line, you and I do not have to work hard to be a nicer person or to love more or forgive more. That ain't ever going to come from our willpower. It hasn't in my life anyway. Maybe I'm wrong. But for me, the only thing that begins to help me a little bit more to love myself, forgive myself and others a little bit more is enjoying the wonder of what Jesus says is the essence of the good news. God is in us, and we share in God's glory. May the Holy Supper remind you of it. May your hearts convince you of it. And may your lives flow in it ever more fully with and through Jesus Christ, your partner and best friend. Amen? Amen.
My bulletin says it's time for the noisy offering. Who's in charge of that? What's happening? And who wants to tell us about it? Sounds good. Sounds better. Oh, that sounds the best because it doesn't make any noise at all. Those bills are quiet, but uh, <laughs> it's just as important and it's just as much a blessing. Thank you all for your gifts. Thank you, kids, for gathering them. And may God bless their use. Now we rise and confess together our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. We pray first, Lord, for our companion synods in Meru, Tanzania, and El Salvador, and Reformation Lutheran Church in Milwaukee. We also pray for all who struggle with health issues. Especially, we ask you to help Judy and Wendy, Larry, Nancy, Ted, Marge, and Ruth, Aaron, Angie, Anna, and Brock, Mark, Stacy, and Kevin, Todd, Andy, and Elnetta, Ken and Jeffrey and Randy and Adela, Karen, Michael, Noah, and Paul, Mary Pat, Philip, Flynn, Fran, Caillou, David, Jim, and Sandy. Also, we ask that you bless and support all who suffer from mental illness from the pandemic, from hunger and homelessness, poverty, or violence. Also, Lord, we pray for ourselves as your instruments of peace in the world. And for this prayer, we need you to pull out your bulletin insert. It is written there for us to pray together. For the talents and the abundance of gifts that are ours, 
for the many people who have been your instruments of goodness in our lives. For the moments when we have known the song of your presence in a special way. When fear rises up in us and we don't believe in our ability to be your instrument. When we lose sight of the truth that we are called and equipped to be instruments of your goodness. when emptiness, loneliness, and other struggles keep us from hearing your melody of love. As we allow more and more of who we are to enjoy and absorb your presence and love, as the song of your love grows in us and the call to be your instrument becomes clearer to us. As we go forth from here with the desire to be an ever more faithful instrument of your love. Into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way, also, after supper, he took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, Drink ye all of it. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. It is shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this often to remember me. We pray together the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Come to the table of the Lord.
the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen and keep you in his grace. Amen. God of abundance, with this bread of life and cup of salvation, you have united us with Christ, making us one with all your people. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ our Lord. Go in peace, love and serve the Lord. Thank you.